Thanks, Claire. Boy, uh, I love the body. I love worshiping together as the body. As I was just um, worshiping up here and you were speaking and you were declaring praise to God, I just began to get choked up up here. Just how God, good God is to actually place the glory of his son in our hearts and the power of the spirit to make us want to shout the praises of God. And isn't that a good thing that we can be with people who actually delight in the Lord and have seen and tasted his goodness and want others, want to from their hearts bring worship and adoration and praise to God. So I want to thank you. I want to thank all the worship team, but I want to thank you as a congregation for ministering to one another and ministering to me. In Luke's gospel, Luke is talking to Theophilus writing to Theophilus, giving him a detailed account of the ministry of Jesus. And I often kind of just trek back and, and wonder, who is this Theophilus, this mysterious one whose name means one who loves God? All I know as we're kind of working through some of this, these things is that Jesus is very intent on giving him a vision of the kingdom. He's announcing the kingdom of God is here. And I think uh, as he is doing this, he is engaging, in some way engaging Theophilus to give himself wholly to the kingdom of God, to, to pull back all the stops, to have no doubt or hesitation about who Christ is and why he came and what he's accomplished and where this thing is moving. And uh, that's what we want for all of you. What a great day to come and uh, celebrate the baptisms of several uh, young men and women today. And as we're doing that, to anticipate in that, that this is, again, just the beginning. That as we read the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is his intent. His intent is to take a small group of people in Victoria, Minnesota, and scatter them to the nations. I was sitting with uh, my daughter Kathy last night as she was texting with her friend Sarah. And Sarah is uh, living in India, and Kathy said, we're all scattered. She had tears in her eyes. And I said, yeah, but just for a little while. You know, we deeply long to be together, the ones that we love, but the Lord scatters and sends us to the neighborhoods and to the nations. But he's taking this motley crew of people and bringing people from every tribe and tongue and nation. It's worth it. He is worthy. Oh, the day when, it'll, when we will gather together around the throne and rejoice as we, I can't even say the country we prayed for, but I know where it is, <laughs> there by Eritrea this morning, when people from every tribe and tongue and nation are before the throne. And as we come to this text of Scripture, it's a warning text, but thank God for warning texts. As we get another warning text, we'll have another one next week as we come to the Word of God. Thank God that God warns us to move us out of complacency. Thank God that he speaks clearly to engage us fully. Our prayer over the, the five that are being baptized today is that they would find such freedom, such joy, such liberty in Jesus Christ that God would use them to repeat and retell the great story of the gospel. But as we watch, we are meant to be reminded this is our story. And God is calling us to be engaged. And he's given us the opportunity to be in, on mission with him and there's absolute certainty around it. But Jesus warns in this passage of Scripture that there can be a, a temptation towards indecision. You might say it in different ways, but what I really see happening here is people coming to Jesus and saying, can you give me one more proof? As if that would be the thing that would trigger the right response out of them and make it a legitimate response. And, and I just want to say, for some of you, you may be in pause, um, mo not motion, but pause condition right now, where you're just going, it's been hard, it's been difficult, I've kind of parked the car of my spirituality off to the side, I'm saying, God, you're just going to have to show up. And, and I'm hoping today that Jesus and the Holy Spirit show up with power today, and you say, no longer park or neutral. No longer. Let's shift gears. Let's go. Let's follow. Let's declare. Let's rejoice. Let's see what he will do. He loves to work through his people. He loves to make known his glory. And so that's my prayer. But I'm going to ask you um, to pray with me again. And here's my prayer 
um, for you, and I want you to pray. Um, say, God, let me, let me embrace this warning. Because fathers warn those of their children they love. Uh, but let me embrace it as grace. Let me embrace it in such a way that when I leave here, I pull out that, those kind of things that I'll do, the, the kind of negotiating I do with you, oh God. If you do this, then I'll do that, right? Rather to say, you've done this. Uh, no turning back. No turning back. So would you pray with me? And, and let's ask Christ to do that today. Heavenly Father, um, it is easy for me to pause and say, God, can you give me one more proof? One more sign before I follow, before I speak, before I engage? It's very easy, Heavenly Father, for all of us to, to be like the people of Israel, just continually asking for another sign, asking you. Heavenly Father, would you remove from us any doubt, any hesitation as we watch uh, these men and women get baptized today, these young men and women, would we go, oh God, may I just stand up today and, and testify again and afresh. I, I belong to Jesus and he is worthy and I'll, I'll follow him. Would you do that work today? Oh God, thank you that sometimes you say things in such a way that we can't help but go, oh wow, that's me. And thank you that you say that not to condemn us, but to free us. So free us again. For your kingdom and for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. We've talked about the things that hinder us in the kingdom of God. You know, there's toxic anxiety, there's toxic self-righteousness. And one of the things that I want us to see this morning is another thing that gets um, toxic in a culture is toxic indecision. Uh, we, we, we pause, we need more information, we need more proof, we need more evidence. This is a culture that is plagued with the problem that if I had more data, I'd feel better about the whole thing. I, I want to read to you a quote from Edwin Friedman from his book, Failure of Nerve, in a chapter that he calls Data Junkyards and Data Junkies. And he's saying that one of the problems with our culture is that we become, especially with technology, data junkies. But he says what's happened is that we have so much data at our fingertips, so much new data coming all the time, you would think that we could be better at being decisive. He says it's done the opposite. It's paralyzed us. And not only that, it's made us anxious because we have this little fear that we haven't got it quite right and maybe there'll be a new piece of information next week that'll set us free. And so it ends up having the exact opposite of freedom and peace. So listen to what he says. He says, as long as leaders, parents, healers, managers, base their confidence on how much data they have required, they're doomed to feeling inadequate forever. I just want to stop here and say, you know, I can hear the voice of Satan saying to Christians, if you only had a newer, fresher moment of experience, you'd be better equipped for the kingdom of God, right? You get that nagging sense. My dear friends, we have Jesus, right? We have the risen and reigning Christ. So Friedman writes, they'll never catch up. The situation can only worsen. Yet everywhere in our society, the social science construction of reality has confused information with expertise know-how with wisdom, change with, almo uh, with almost anything new, and complexity with profundity. Neither parents nor presidents will ever be able to escape the flood of data that engulfs them, either by trying to limit its expansion or by, by trying to keep up with its flow. My dear friends, the answer isn't more or less data. Another sign, another piece of information, and suddenly we'll feel better about our future and our ability to function in it. And especially for us as Christians, we don't need another sign. We've got Jesus. We don't need another evidence. We have the risen and reigning Christ. And I want to ask you the question this morning, as if you have parked it, if you have hesitated, 
if you said to God, I just need a sign before I follow, would you take the warning today and say, that's not what you need. What I need is to believe Jesus, to trust the gospel. That's all I need. I need nothing more than Jesus Christ. Choosing to hold out for more evidence is actually choosing to resist Jesus and his gospel call of grace, right? Choosing to wait for more evidence is, is resisting Jesus' call upon your life right now. That doesn't mean he doesn't graciously do it. He shows up all the time, but that's not what's to move us. What's to move us is he is crucified, ra- uh, risen, and now reigning over all things. That message is the message of hope. Philip Ryken says in this text of scripture, this warning is for religious people who know something about Jesus but have not received him as their Savior and Lord. Let me just stop here. Some of you online or at home may have um, said to yourself, I just need more proof. If I had just a little more proof, then maybe I'd buy in. A little more evidence, and maybe I'd buy in. That's not what you need. You need Christ to set you free eyes to see, and ears to hear. You need to hear Jesus today say, you have all you need in me and in the gospel. And I hope today that what God would do, if you're hesitating all, and, and I, I, I empathize this, I don't want to sound condemning whatsoever. We've all said this. And, and there is a sense in which I want God to make the gospel real to me all the time. But I need to say to you that there is a toxic danger that you need to be aware of because you can get on the hamster wheel of needing more and more evidence and not get on with Jesus Christ and the gospel and come to him. And so let's look at this text of scripture and receive the warning in kind of two ways. Jesus sets it up in two ways for us and we can say, you know, what will help us, what will help uh, uh, you overcome the need uh, to get more information or else we stay in park? We stay in neutral. We stay in delay. And if, if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and you're saying, yes, this is me. I have parked my spirituality. You can just pray right now. Jesus, speak in such a way that I am no longer in park. That I am moving in mission and in ministry towards you. And here's the first thing that we see in this text of scripture. Uh, the blessing of being clearly decisive. The blessing of Jesus. This is what you and I need to hear. That in this text of scripture, Jesus is saying, you know the blessed state is? You hear and you go. You hear and you respond. So Jesus has been teaching and doing miracles and confronting the religious leaders. And as he's moving along, we're told in this text of scripture that a woman raises his vo- her voice. Verse 27. And as he said these things, a woman in, her cr- in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. And uh, I don't know what her kids were like, but there was something in her going, man, what a great son you are. (laughs) Uh, What a blessed son. What a blessed is the woman who gave birth to you. She's watching. She's listening. She's seeing Jesus' ministry. She's impacted by it. And the thought that goes through her head is, blessed is the woman who gave birth. She's attributing what's going on to Jesus to his mother. And we, we know down through history, professing Christians have continually tried to give credit for Jesus' life and ministry to his mother. It has something to do with who she was, her perfection, uh, you know, her immaculate conception, however you want to describe it, pointing to Mary and saying, that woman is somehow responsible for who you are. And moms, you like that, right? <laughs> when it's going well. But that's not what Jesus settles in. Jesus corrects her response, her, her declaration. I mean, I admire her declaration. I want to be gracious to this woman. She is positively inclined when other people are pessimistically reacting. But she's pointing to Mary as if Mary was the cause of Jesus' upbringing and his success and his ministry. But Jesus immediately says what he has says in other places about his mother and his family. But he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You know. 
immediately responds. And, and this is really what Luke is teaching Theophilus, and this is what he's teaching us. It's not that Jesus is Mary's son that brings her honor. It's that Jesus is Mary's savior, right? It's not that he's her son. And again, certainly she's blessed to have that. But in the scriptures, it's when the angel came to Mary, what she gets con uh, commended for is that when the angel spoke, different than Zechariah in the Gospel of Luke, Zechariah said in a negative way, how shall this be? And because he didn't believe, he wasn't able to speak until the birth of John the Baptist. But we're told that Mary, when she heard, she actually believed. Listen to Luke chapter 1, verse 46. When Elizabeth comes, um, and, and, or Mary greets Elizabeth, visits Elizabeth, and the Holy Spirit comes upon her. Luke 1, 46. Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, is filled with the Holy Spirit. She declares, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Do you remember what Mary said when the angel came to her? That's right. May it be done to me as you have said. Let's go. Let's go. That was her response. Jesus is saying, that's what it means to be blessed. The blessed person is the person who doesn't sit there and negotiate and ask, oh, you're the most free person, the most blessed person by God is the one who hears the word of God and goes, great, go, help, may it be, lead on, O King Eternal, take me and go. You hear that? It's that responsiveness to the word of God, that reaction by faith. Listen to Philip Reichen again. He says, it's not Mary's person that calls for blessing, but her Sorry, it's not Mary. Yeah, it's not Mary's person that calls for a blessing, but her trust in Christ and her obedience to the word of Christ. Rather than Mary becoming an object of our praise, Mary serves as an example of our faith. We're to look at Mary and go, wow, Mary, that's the kind of faith I want to have. That when God says, you will be a pregnant single mom in a culture that will reject you and condemn you, she goes, okay. Right? You hear, you hear that against Jesus called to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me? And you go, is this going to be easy? Is, do you get baptized and it's easy street? Sorry, Braxton, just so you know. <laughs> it's a challenge. You, you, you live in a fallen world and you, you've got to battle the struggles. But here's the good news. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And he will use you in the hard times and the difficult times in the broken world. He'll use you to point others to the only hope of their forgiveness, the only hope of meaning for their life, the only hope of deliverance from depression and discouragement and despair, sin and condemnation and Satan. And in this gospel, Jesus is saying, come on, let's go. Deny yourself, take care of God. He fixed his face to Jerusalem. God said, go. Jesus says, let's go. Jesus looks to his disciples, the nations, let's go. And that's the blessed person. The blessed person is the person in the grace of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says go, they don't sit there and calculate a thousand different things. They look and say, you're the king. You're my savior. I want to go. Augustine says, Mary was more blessed in accepting the faith of Christ than in conceiving the flesh of Christ. It's a great line. Augustine, Mary was more blessed not by having the flesh of Jesus Christ come from her, but having the faith of Jesus Christ living and dwelling in here. So let me just pause and say, okay, here's what Jesus is saying, that the reaction of faith and obedience to the gospel, to the call of God, that's the blessed person, to respond quickly, not to delay. But it, I want you just to pause and think for a minute, why is that a blessing? Because this is one of those times at a baptism service or when we stop and think, why is it so blessed? Why are we so blessed to have been given the grace of having our eyes open and our ears unstopped and our heart of stone being made a heart of flesh? Why is that a blessing to us? Let me tell you why it's a blessing to us. There's several reasons. You could have many, but here are some of them. Number one, you can have the assurance of forgiveness and freedom from guilt and shame in Jesus Christ. Isn't that a blessing? To trust and believe the gospel, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. To live in anxiety 
over your own spiritual condition or to believe that your sins have been washed away and that you were received by God. If anyone confesses their sins, he is faithful and just to forgive their sins and be cleansed from all unrighteousness. Isn't that good news? That's a blessing that comes from believing the gospel and following Christ. Number one, the joy of adoption and knowing that you are loved and accepted by the Father. The joy of adoption and knowing that you've been in love and accepted. I don't know how many people in the stories uh, of Waterbrook, of coming to faith in Jesus Christ, come out of broken families and feeling alienated from parents and the painful experiences, but in the middle of that, suddenly they hear this voice, God is your Father. You can cry out, Abba, Father. Isn't blessing just to, to, to believe the gospel and follow rather than live in anxiety and uncertainty all of your life? You can know for certain that you are a child of God. To those who received him and believed on his name, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God. Oh, amazing love of God, that we should be called the children of God. What a blessing. That is what we are. See, the fellowship, the comfort, the conviction, and the correction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I'll not leave you as orphans. I will give you my spirit. And that spirit will lead you into truth. He'll convict you of sin. Right? He'll show you my glory. He'll make known me, the Father to you through me. Here's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do this in your own strength. To drop it all and not carry the burden. To look to God and immediately believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the assurance that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has sealed you as his own and will never let you go. You don't have to live in your own strength. Isn't that why we need all the data? Isn't that why we need another sign just so that I can put the puzzle together and own it and make a right and accurate decision? Stop! You don't have to carry the load. You don't have to save yourself. You don't have to, you don't even have to figure it all out. One day, it'll all be abundantly clear that he is faithful and good. Isn't it wonderful, Belo the blessing of belonging to the family of God, being welcomed, accepted, and encouraged and cared for by the people of God. Isn't, isn't that amazing? You are now part of an eternal family. You've been adopted into his family, into his household. And that's why I love being part of the church, the local church. Because the local church is a place where we sing and remind each other. We look each other in the eye. We listen to each other's pain and we remind each other that we are part of the family of God. And we are to encourage each other while it's still called today. Right? We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves as the custom of some, but to encourage one another. Thank you for encouraging me today. Thank you. To hear you worship God, for, for, to hear you say the glorious things about God. That for, for it, is a, it is a joy for me. So this last week, on July the 7th, so the seventh month, seventh day, was my seven years as the pastor, uh, one of the pastors here at Waterbrook. And I thought, man, God, you are so kind to me. To put me in a family. To adopt me. To make me yours and to make me belong in a world where, you know, we're trying to belong by calculating and, and performing. I don't have, sorry, I don't have to perform to belong to you, right? I hope. Not in the family of God. What a blessing to know that your life matters to God and makes a difference for all eternity. You know, we're trying to calculate all the right answers, get the things right because so, we don't want to waste our life. Don't you want a purpose in your life? My dear friends, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you might declare the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into a glorious light. You have a reason to breathe, to get up in the morning. Oh, blessed are the, per the one who hears and says, yes, Jesus. I will come and follow. The promise of constant care and intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ right now those of you who are at home, and the reason you're at home is because you're sick and you can't come to worship. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. You are not alone. You are not abandoned. You will not be forsaken. He is at the throne of grace. Isn't that good news? 
That's the truth that we've said. Jesus intercedes for us. The assurance, the courage, and the comfort of the resurrection. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Here's the great news. The story is not ending. We can feel uh, our age coming upon us, a disease coming upon us, life shutting down on us at certain points in time, sometimes at uh, drastically unexpected times. Here's the good news. That's not the end of the story. Resurrection. He will make it all new. You see, you see what I'm saying? Oh, man. Jesus is saying the most blessed first people of the world, the people who hear Jesus call and say, I'm coming with you, Jesus. Save me, heal me, be my king, be my savior. That's the blessed situation, person. But then he gives the warnings. There are dangers of being unresponsive. The dangers of being indecisive. To say to Jesus, well, I just need a, a little more evidence, a little more proof, a little delay, a little gap, maybe a little more of this. Let me give you several things that Jesus teaches in this text of scripture. Number one, indecision can be the, so, the sin and the sign of a wicked generation. And, and I just want you to stop and think of our culture. Our culture and its need for more proof and its cynicism. I, you know, that's, you know, even Richard Dawkins, I quoted him last week. I, I remember Dawkins writing and saying, if God actually exists, he is going to have to answer one day for not being clearer. My dear friends, the heavens declare the glory of God. And creation leaves us without any excuse. God will not answer. But even more than that, God sent his son to manifest himself, to make known the way to glory, to make us right in God. So listen to what Jesus says. It says, when the crowds were increasing... <laughs> I gotta tell you this. So next week is we're gonna do our building project thing. Uh, sorry, thing. That sounds really expert like, right? <laughs> next week we're going to present our hard work on the building project. But I laugh because I'm going through Luke and and next week we're doing all the woes. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not leaving it. Because I, I'm going to preach this text of scripture and saying, this is not a building he's building, it's a church and a kingdom. And if we don't do these things, forget building a building. Amen. Right? We got, we got a calling and a cause. And Jesus, in this text of scripture, gives this is clear warning. When the crowds were increasing, he said, let's figure out how to keep them coming. No. He just pulled no punches. He said, this generation is an evil generation it seeks for a sign but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah for as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh so the son of man so will the son of man be to this generation here in that the gospel Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem Jesus has not yet gone to the cross but Jesus is going to the cross and he says you're going to get a Jonah sign you're not going to get this is an evil generation a perverse generation that keeps saying, I need more evidence. You don't need more evidence. That's perversion. Especially where we live now, in this part of history. But Jesus says, I'm not going to give another sign. I'm not going to give you any other sign but the sign of Moses. It's an evil. If you were a Jewish person, hearing Jesus says, this is an evil and perverse generation that asks for a sign, a devout Jew would know what he's talking about. Because Jesus is, in effect, quoting Psalm 95. He's referencing, because in the Old Testament, God speaks about the Jewish people in the wilderness as constantly needing another sign. And he says, that was perversion. I delivered them out of Egypt. I did a thousand signs. Pharaoh needs another sign and won't listen. Not my people. My people don't need another sign it says see if I can grab it real quick here grab your Bible and go to Psalm 95 I want you to read see this warning Psalm 95 verse 10 and 11 
Or verse, let, go back to verse, beginning of verse 8. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like Israel did at Meribah, as on the day at Mass in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and, and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation. This is an evil generation that asked for a sign. Even though they had seen my work, they are people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So here's one of the things. When we say I need another sign to go, you need to understand that's perversity. That's evil. That's corruption. It's a sign of a corrupt generation. It's not a sign of... Per now, I'm, this, this is for people who have encountered God. I'm not saying you don't have legitimate questions to wrestle through. But you can have a habit of saying the reason I'm not acting is God hasn't been clear enough. I'm sorry, that's not true. That can't be true. And if that's our inclination, God is not going to give you signs so that you can ask him for more signs later. So that you can keep going. Matthew Henry says, Christ is always ready to hear and answer holy desires and prayers, yet he will not gratify corrupt lusts and humors. He won't do it. I will give them the sign of Jonah. Matthew chapter 12, what's the sign of Jonah? He says, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's the sign. He doesn't have to give us any other sign. Now, isn't it gracious that he gives rebellious sinners the sign of Jonah? A sign like Jonah? Just like Jonah going to Nineveh, gets thrown overboard, and you read Jeremiah chapter 2, and he declares salvation is of the Lord. He gets swallowed by a fish, and he's three days there. What's going on there? It, God is showing to the people of Nineveh that he can raise the dead. And he's not just going to show it symbolically through Jonah. He's going to do it through his son. And Jesus will be crucified and spend three days and on the third day rise again. And that's the sign that we get. My dear friends, the, the death and resurrection is enough of a reason for us to say yes to Jesus right now. And anything less than that is perversion. Sproul writes, no miracle will ever be sufficient to engender faith within those who love their sin and refuse to turn to God. People are being insincere when they say they'll believe if they see a miracle. For there is pl plenty of evidence of the truth of Jesus in the accounts of his resurrection, the spread of the gospel, and the lives and societies changed by obedience to his message. Pray that you will always be able to see these proofs for the truth of our Lord, these proofs for the truth of our Lord's words. God gives us that ability. C.S. Lewis complained in his day of the religious leaders of his day who were picking away at the miracles. And he said they, can, they claim as religious leaders to be able to see fern seeds, the, the smallest my, my, uh, minute truth, but they can't see elephants. And what he meant was the truth of the gospel and the power of the, re the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at the disciples, who they were, and who they became. And that's proof that this Christ is risen, reigning. So that's the first thing. It's a sign of perversion. Secondly, indecision, can, you need to hear this warning, can lead to greater condemnation. It can lead to greater condemnation. What does Jesus say? He says in verse 30, uh, for jo as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the son of man... So will the Son of Man be to this generation, the Queen of the South. Who's that? Right, the Queen of Sheba who came to Solomon. And in, in the Old Testament, it says, the Queen of Sheba will rise up at the judgment and men of the ge generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Now, Jesus is teaching the resurrection. <laughs> He's teaching the judgment right now. He says, the queen of Sheba, you're going to see her again. But some of you are not going to be happy to see her. Because on that day, she's going to stand up and say, I just got a sniff of wisdom and glory in Africa. I just got a sniff of it, and I said, I got to find out. I got to seek. 
I got to go. And she traveled and went to see the son of David. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 6 and 7. And she said to the king, the report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom, but I did not believe the reports until I came and my eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report I heard. And this is what Jesus says. That was Solomon. There's a greater Solomon here now. <laughs> that Solomon was wise, but I am wisdom. That Solomon ruled justly, but I will bring justice and righteousness. That Solomon did finish well, and I'll tell you, my kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and my glory will go on for eternity. I will finish gloriously well, and the nations will come around. You understand what's being said here? That was uh, a Solomon. This is the Solomon. That was a fallen, frail, <laughs> imperfect, yet glorious ruler over Israel. This is the eternal king of the nations before you. And so that woman will rise up and say, oh, you thought you needed another sign? I smelt wisdom. I heard glory. And I shifted gears to go find out. Are you shifting gears to go find out? Are you making excuses for why you won't seek Jesus? That activity will actually bring stricter judgment on you. Not only is it the queen of Sheba, but the men of Nineveh. Notice what he says here, verse 32. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah here. There's a greater Solomon or someone greater than Jonah. The men of Nineveh smelt the stinky fish vomit on Jonah rolling in to preach the gospel. And he, t he didn't even give them hope, right? You are going to be condemned. Judgment is coming. And the king said, everybody fast. Something in that awareness, something by the grace of God penetrated that when Jonah said they were evil, they knew they were evil. And my dear friends, are you aware of any sin in your life? The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to now say the burden is on Jesus to prove that Jesus is who he claims to be? No, the burden's on you. Who do you claim to be? And no need of a Savior? Who do you claim to be? Righteous and unstained that somehow God is in the dock and you're the one who's judging? My dear friends, on that day the men of Nineveh will get up and say, when he spoke, when Jonah spoke, we said, man, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let's flee. And that maybe God will have mercy on us. When Jesus comes and declares that this, that, and, and, and this is the declaration that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and we hear, we ought to go, man, I've lied. I've been dishonest. I've lusted. I've been proud. I've been unkind. I've, I, the story could go on ad nauseum. And Jesus has come that I might be forgiven and set free. Isn't that great, gracious news? Now, now act. Now is the day of salvation. Now run to him. Now hear the men of Nineveh. If you could hear them now, they would be going from heaven. Run! He's that good. He, they were so bad, Jonah didn't want to preach the gospel to them. Man, we're bad. And Jesus came to be the gospel for us. It'll lead to greater, greater condemnation. Thirdly, and finally, indecision can slide towards rapid degeneration. That's that section in verse 33 to 36. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar under a basket but on a stand so that those who enter it may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Now listen to this. Be careful lest the light in you be darkness. I just want you to stop and say here, your eyes determine whether or not you can see and what gets in and what goes into you. And he says if your eyes are 
if you're light, maybe it's scientific evidence, maybe it's, you know, more data, maybe it's, you know, looking for the perfect church, whatever it is. You've got all this data you're gathering, right? And you've got this eye that's looking cynically at all those things. And through the grid of your cynicism, everything gets polluted. You need your eyes fixed. You need to lift your eyes to the light. Because one of the things that happens is that if, if whatever's light to you, it could be religion. That was what was going on in Jesus' day. The religion was their, where their, was their light, and it kept them from seeing the light, their need of Jesus Christ. But what ends up happening is that it begins to devolve. It, the question that needs to be asked of us, how dark is your heart? How dark is your life if you're light is keeping you from receiving Jesus Christ and the gospel. Let me share with you some of the things that happen, the degenerating things that happen in our lives. Number one, like, like uh, Friedman says with this kind of data junkies we become, we become incredibly helpless and depressed and anxious. You know, you don't have hope. Where's your hope come? This is a culture that has turned away from God and is incredibly anxious incredibly hopeless and incredibly depressed. The news is as pessimistic as you can believe. The counseling offices are as full. The medications are being distributed like unbelievable. And I'm not saying we don't need some of those things, but let me tell you this, that if you turn away from the light, it'll get really dark. And then when we have anxiety and depression and guilt and shame, we turn to idolatry and addiction. We need something to save us, something to take the pain away, something to relieve us. And it generates, how dark is it? I want, this is the question I want to ask you. How dark is it in you? And then we turn to immorality and infidelity and all the things that we think will substitute. Where am I going to get my life? And then you could actually turn to religion to try to fix it and it won't work. He's going to try to say my prayers and do my devotions and show to church, help to church every once in a while. Friends, let's just stop. You don't have to do any of that. You can run to Jesus. You can listen and receive him. Don't, don't say, show me another sign. Don't say, I won't if you don't do this. Just run to Jesus. If you don't run to Jesus and the light goes out, my dear friends, it ain't pretty. The world ain't pretty without Jesus. It ain't pretty. Run to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Be forgiven by Jesus today. Or as Psalm 95 says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Don't do it. Isn't that a good warning? Isn't it a gracious warning? Don't delay. We watch these baptisms. <laughs> Thank you. Don't delay. Run to Jesus. Process. Seek him. Find him. Follow him. Ble the blessed person is the one who hears and says yes. Not more evidence, please. Not more questions, please. Let's bow our heads and pray together. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I want to pray right now for people online, people here in this room who have been holding Jesus at bay, saying, I need more proof, I need more time, I need more evidence. Father, the, the reality is we just need Jesus, the crucified, risen, and reigning Christ. Oh, Jesus, would you breathe on us today that we would say yes to Jesus? Right now, right now, say yes to Jesus. And pour out the blessings of forgiveness and fellowship, adoption and sonship. Pour out the blessings, dear God, of the help of the Holy Spirit and the promises of God that will never let us go. Help us, O oh God, we pray. Hear our cry in Jesus' name. Amen.